Hi everybody, welcome to TIA Now. I'm Clarence Reynolds and welcome to TIA's live reaction to the FCC's vote to streamline 5G deployment across America. Earlier today, the FCC adopted a much discussed declaratory ruling and order on wireless infrastructure. Now this order is, in par is part of a national strategy to promote the timely build out of a new infrastructure across the country by eliminating regulatory impediments that unnecessarily add delays and costs to bringing advanced wireless services to the public. Joining me today are John Godfrey, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at Samsung, Jeff Marks, Head of Regulatory Affairs, North America for Nokia, and Dalip Srihari, Senior Policy Counsel and Director of Government Affairs here at TIA. Welcome to you all. Uh, we want to start out, first of all, uh, talking about today's order. What did that order provide? Well, thanks, Clarence. So uh, at a high level, uh, today's order was the culmination of a process that the FCC has been working on for, I'd say, the past year and a half, uh, pretty much since uh, uh, Chairman Pai took office. So he delegated and asked Commissioner Carr to really lead up the work on this infrastructure order. So basically, uh, at the end of this process, you have an order that has basically four components. So the first is uh, essentially a declaratory ruling that prohibits certain practices, such as complete moratoria at a state or local level that have the effect of prohibiting um, the deployment of wireless service. Um, the second is that the order uh, establishes uh, some reasonable fee recovery limitations uh, for small cells and there are actually specific dollar amounts that are considered sort of presumptive thresholds that are established in the order. Um, the third aspect is that it includes shot clocks, which are uh, time windows by which um, state and local governments have to review the siting applications that are submitted to them so that there's some reasonable assurance for carriers in terms of how long it will take to deploy um, the new infrastructure. And last, um, they've put some guardrails on other municipal rules, um, but at the same time, they did reaffirm um, the rights of state and local governments on some important aspects of this, like aesthetic reviews, for example. So those are basically the four pieces of today's item. We're going to unpack all four of those uh, a little bit later, but first of all, just want to talk about how 5G infrastructure differs from other wireless infrastructure we've had in the past. Sure, I'd be happy to comment on that, Clarence. Uh, but first, you know, I just want to say today is a really good day for the country, and congratulations to Commissioner Carr for leading this effort in particular. Uh, it's a great order that came out today. It's going to be important for future deployment of wireless infrastructure, which is really helpful to the country, uh, not only for 5G, but especially for 5G. 5G is the next wave of wireless capability, a whole new generation. And um, 5G is faster. It enables lower latency, it enables higher device density, a, a bundle of capabilities that are going to take wireless to a whole new level. One of the things about 5G that's relevant to today is that uh, particularly in the higher frequencies, which are where there's more spectrum, so there's more carrying capacity, that's where you get the really dramatic data rates, like up to a gigabit per second, maybe even more. That's in the higher frequencies. Um, but the signals don't propagate as far as the lower frequency signals do. And so that means you need more cellular base stations closer together to cover uh, an area. Uh, and that's why they're called small cells. The cells are actually smaller. But fortunately, the equipment is a lot smaller also. So we don't need towers everywhere. <laughs> right. At, at so, every you know, traditionally you think right. of, I mean, you know, broadcast television towers are hundreds of feet high. Right. Uh, earlier, you know, large, lower frequency cellular towers like you have for 2G or 3G uh, and even, you know, even for 4G, maybe a, maybe a 100 foot tower or 50 foot tower or something like that. Sometimes they disguise them as pine trees. But what we're talking about here uh, small cells are things that could go on a street light or on the corner of a building, uh, much less obtrusive. Yeah, and I should say that, uh, you know, there are different types of infrastructure that will be used for 5G, um, including larger towers for coverage, including fiber that needs to go in the ground to, to offload the traffic from the small cells or from the towers. But small cells are the new paradigm. Small cells are what uh, localities 
um, didn't have to deal with until recently. And we'll get into this more as, the, as, as we go on, I, I think, but, but it's that there is the multiple small cells uh, in numbers that we're not used to seeing that need to be deployed close to the user to make 5G a reality. And, and globally, is, was today's decision, today's order, really important to us winning this race to 5G? And why is that important? Well, it's, it's funny, you know, you say that the, the race to 5G is won. So the U.S., most people believe, won the race to 4G. It's what gave us some of the amazing net economy products that we have today. The superstars of Facebook and Google, and those are all... And my beloved Netflix. And Netflix, yes. they're, they're here. Uh, and, and the reason that, uh, that they opened here is partly because we had the 4G networks to support them. So the, the race to 5G is a real thing. The concern is that there are other economies like China, for example, um, which are moving forward in a way that the U.S. is not. Now, some of them we can't do, and I'm not suggesting that we have a command and control economy in the same way as China. For example, they just recently rolled out, I think, 40,000 small cells in Shanghai and Beijing in about six weeks. We're not going to do that in the U.S. But we have to look at that and see between that and some of their spectrum policies where they're moving faster on mid-band spectrum and high-band spectrum than we are getting it actually out into carrier hands that you know, threaten, if we get too far behind, that some of the superstars of the 5G economy could grow there in a way that you know, the U.S. has been the home to that innovation. I totally agree, Clarence, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit later more about what some of the things 5G is going to enable are and how important they'll be to the economy. Um, I think the United States actually did take an early lead in 5G by making uh, millimeter wave spectrum available here for mobile service before anybody else in the world. And uh, the fruits of that are going to be apparent starting next week when Verizon launches their 5G home service in four cities across the United States. Uh, it's a high-speed fixed wireless access service, but it's in the same spectrum that they will be able to use for mobile once mobile devices with 5G come along. Um, but the, so the U.S. allocated this spectrum, but the rest of the world has caught up in a way, and in fact, in South Korea this summer, they auctioned off millimeter wave spectrum and also mid-band spectrum in the three gigahertz range to South Korean telecom carriers, whereas the U.S. Uh, auctions are still to be had. The 28 gigahertz auction will happen this fall. So, um, so some U.S. carriers already had that spectrum and are, have begun to deploy, but the auction to get more of that spectrum into carriers' hands is still to happen. Uh, so Spectrum is part of the 5G puzzle. The other part is actually building the network in that Spectrum, and that's what today's order is about. It's about streamlining the network building process. And Dilip, when you were giving sort of the components of today's order, you mentioned moratoria. What, what did you mean by that? Well, we've seen uh, across the country that in some, some state and local situations, mostly I think at the local level, um, there have been various concerns uh, about uh, that have been raised uh, in the communities. And, and in some cases, we just see local governments that are not capable of dealing with those and just say, well, we're going to throw up our hands and impose a complete moratoria on, on putting up anything until we can sort of you know get our heads around it or, or figure it out and uh, th that's really harmful to deployment especially when you think about the scenario that Jeff is describing when it when we're in this race to deploy against other parts of the world and so uh, the Commission was very concerned about those moratoria and so basically part of today's order was to essentially declare that under federal law uh, under provisions uh, without getting too complicated sections 
253 and 332 of the Communications Act, which basically say that state and local requirements have to be reasonable and, and no unreasonable requirements that effectively prohibit the deployment of service are allowed. And the FCC basically said today, okay, if you impose one of those moratoria or other conditions that effectively have the same effect of completely prohibiting the deployment of wireless service, that's not allowed under the Communications Act. We have tools to help you and we're going to work on streamlined processes, but a town cannot just simply, cannot simply throw up its hands and say, no, we're just going to totally prohibit this. So that's what they were trying to address there. They can't prohibit it and they've determined in today's order that taking a long time to give an answer is effectively the same thing as prohibiting. And that's a real step forward. Yeah, we, we've had uh, problems for years with uh, companies that wanted to be on the cutting edge of small cell deployment ordering sometimes tens of thousands of small cells and then they'd go from town to town <laughs> trying to deploy to improve the network uh, connectivity in those communities and finding that they, they either are not the community's not accepting applications or they file the application and it sits for some we have an example of, of it as long as three years without without being uh, acted on so so this this order uh, seeks to make clear that that is not acceptable and there were also some fee limitations set as well yes so uh, the uh, the FCC has actually encountered a, a number of stories of state and local governments that have been charging exorbitant fees. I think I'll maybe let Jeff explain some of those. But what they basically did was, was say, okay, we're going to set some baseline limits, and we're going to say that any fees that you recover uh, for citing small cells, either the initial application fees or the ongoing recurring fees, those have to be tied to the actual costs that the, that the that the town incurs in doing the permitting process or associated with the public rights of way. So they set some, I think, fairly reasonable limitations. They basically said uh, for up to the first five small cells, because there's, these things are probably going to be deployed in, in, in bulk, um, we're going to charge $500 for the first five small cells. And then after that, $100 per small cell for every additional. So it's a, it's a reasonable sort of $100 kind of pricing structure that, they, that they've set up for the initial application fee. And then for the recurring fees, the ongoing sort of rental fees, you could say, it's $270 per small, small cell. And they've based those numbers off of a survey that they've done of a number of state uh, small cell legislation that's similar to this and their sort of experience of what's sort of reasonable and provides a reasonable cost recovery to the local government. So I think it's a, it's a big step forward and there's now some clear guidance to every community in the country about, okay, if you charge at least not more than this, then the FCC is going to presumptively say, okay, that's reasonable. Yeah, I think it, it's important and I don't think we've stressed enough that a number of localities have, are doing a good job and uh, over 20 states have passed laws to rationalize uh, small cell deployments uh, regulation in, in their localities and so what we have here is a situation where the FCC didn't pull fees out of thin air they, they looked at good best practices by other localities and, and chose, uh, chose from, from that sampling um, fees that that were reasonable and that were being used in real in the real world by other other localities and were should serve as guides to those who either don't have fees at all or are charging these exorbitant fees uh, unfortunately there are bad actors out there that are looking to use um, their rights of way as, as revenue generators as opposed to ways to improve connectivity and broadband and access to all that has to offer to their citizenry. Um, I, I would, a, a word that I found interesting was that the FCC focused on consultants. And what we found is that the consultants are a good tool for some localities in order to get, have, they may not have the personnel or, or the expertise to set up a process for siting of small cells. The problem is that the consultancies often are, are seeking to maximize revenues rather than effectively uh, deploy small cells. And what you get is this escalating cost spiral upward where the next town over gets X and then the consultant moves his operation or is able to get um, a, new, a new client and can point to the new baseline 
And sometimes those baselines are set at special events like a Super Bowl or something like that, where the, so the baseline just kept spiraling upward. The FCC made clear that fees to consultants that are, are high are, are, are for the purpose of, of that revenue uh, bonanza uh, are not uh, an allowable cost. And also, you mentioned that there is now a shot clock because uh, Jeff was talking about um, some applications having seen three years as a, you know, just an outlier. But it, it is now there is a, 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 a shot clock. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the order establishes timelines. So the timelines, and they're specific to small cells. So for a new small cell, uh, construction of a new uh, small wireless facility, uh, the timeline will be 90 days um, for the state and local government to approve, so essentially three months. Uh, and for co-location uh, of, a, of a small cell on an existing wireless facility, um, which is a simpler process essentially, it's a 60-day review process. So still quite a reasonable amount of time for the state and local government to evaluate the application, but it provides some certainty, again, for providers who, are, who have been facing sometimes multi-year delays, that there will actually be t uh, timelines now. It, it just just be, before, in case I wasn't sure where where we lost our connection earlier, mm -hmm. but to just like I said, for fees timelines as well, they're based on the fact that there are communities across the country and legislations in 20 states that set these parameters and that are being that are in place right now. These reasonable time frames, the reasonable fees are, are, are being used already across the country by many, many communities. So those are the examples that were chosen, th those good actors, to address those, those cases that are not so good. And what they're putting in place is a small cell, literally a small cell, um, that is um, in some cases to augment the, the tower structure, infrastructure that we have now. What does that look like, John? Well, um, they're small, and the FCC rule has, actually has a definition in there, and it's based on the, the total volume being 28 cubic feet or smaller. And so I want to talk for just a second about refrigerators. And some of the people in the audience may know why. Uh, there is actually a rumor that is being spread that small cells have, in addition to the antenna up on the tower, a separate unit that is as big as a refrigerator. So the first thing is Samsung is the number one refrigerator brand in America. <laughs> so we know a little bit about refrigerators and I want to tell you that a 28 cubic foot refrigerator isn't, it's much bigger than 28 cubic feet yeah. in size. It's the interior capacity. So the FCC rules do not actually allow something as big as a refrigerator. But more important than that, the vast majority of these small cells are not even going to be as big as that. And to show you what I mean, I have actually brought one. And so hopefully your viewers can see this. Yep. This is a, the, the casing, but it's the actual size and shape and composition of the casing of one of the um, access units that Verizon is deploying for their 5G home service that Samsung has made for them and uh, operates in the 28 gigahertz band and this is the whole thing. So I'll pop off the bottom cover and down here is where the power and the optical fiber go in for the backhaul. There is no other separate unit. What's inside here, uh, the back part is heat radiating fins and then in the front, what you have up, the, up here is the antennas. Uh, and, and maybe a, a good rule of thumb to keep in mind is the higher the frequency, the smaller the equipment. And that's because at higher frequency, the wavelengths, the radio wavelengths are much smaller. The 28 gigahertz band, the 39 gigahertz band that the FCC has set aside, they're called millimeter waves because that's about how long the, the wavelengths are. And so what's up inside here actually is an array of 1,024 antennas in a square and that creates an electrically steerable beam which concentrates the energy in a particular direction and that's really been one of the main breakthroughs that's made 5G possible. 5G has actually come along 
sooner than the worldwide industry expected. And in part, that's because it has turned out that the millimeter wave spectrum is more useful for mobile than people thought it was going to be. Uh, and, and that's because of this beam steering. So the signals propagate further than people thought they would. So this part is the antenna. Down here is the baseband unit. And there is nothing else. This would be mounted on a, a street light, um, maybe actually at the top of the pole, so people walking by wouldn't even notice that it's there, or you know, maybe on the corner of a building. There's not a separate uh, refrigerator, you know, refrigerator-sized unit. And I can tell you that I was at the um, Mobile World Congress Americas show a uh, week before last, talking about our equipment, showing our equipment to visitors in the booth. And someone actually came to the booth and he said to me, John, I've heard, and isn't it true, that along with that base station, there is a refrigerator to keep it cool. <laughs> that is how at, far. At, at each one. At, at each one right. actually has a refrigerator right. to cool it off. No, there's no refrigerator. You know, Samsung, we'd be happy to put a, uh, a refrigerator in your kitchen and, and it may soon be a 5G refrigerator, but there is not going to be a refrigerator on your street light. So let's, let's stop the rumor. And, it, and it's going, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just to say, Nokia does not make refrigerators, uh -huh. but we also do not use refrigerators <laughs> in our small cells. The form factor of our equipment is similar. Yeah, the, uh, the, these are the kinds of rumors that get spread around municipalities, which is what often become barriers to deployment. Um, and, and when you put all this together, Dilip, you, we, we talk a, about the moratoria, the reasonable rates, the shot clocks. How does this all work together to move us forward toward 5G? Well, I think uh, we've talked a fair uh, amount about it today, but really, um, you know, being able to deploy that infrastructure and get it out there promptly and quickly is essentially uh, it's vital to making sure that that the U.S. can maintain its competitiveness. And I think uh, there's a willingness to work together, uh, not just based on today's FCC order, but also to continue working with state and local governments to make that happen. Um, so, you know, for example, the FCC um, actually uh, compromised on, on aspects of today's order. Um, there were some who thought that they could have and should have gone further, but they said, okay, we understand, and Commissioner Carr talked about this today. Um, he said, you know, the state and local government is the one where, you know, you hear about them about, you know, complaints about uh, a device being put up and, you know, near someone's backyard or something like that and so aesthetic conditions and the FCC said sure we understand that the state and local governments absolutely still need the right to deal with reasonable aesthetic requirements to make sure that these things you know uh, look good and are, are contributing to the community and not detracting from it all the FCC did was establish some guardrails and say look, those aesthetic requirements have to be reasonable and you have to disclose them in advance so that uh, a carrier coming in uh, knows what it needs to comply with in advance, which is not at all an unreasonable condition to put on those requirements. So I think, uh, you know, what the commission did today and, you know, commis what Commissioner Carr especially, based on the input that he got from state and local officials, was a, a very measured, reasonable step uh, in that regard that preserves a lot of state and local authority so that we can work collaboratively uh, to make this happen. And you know what, Clarence, hopefully, hopefully the order will never actually have to be invoked. It's placed a marker now that provides some guidance to communities across the country. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they don't, they don't have to wait for the federal government to step in, and, and a lot of them are not. As Jeff was talking about, there's, there's a lot of communities that are already moving ahead. There are communities that are charging less than these amounts, that are taking less than this amount of time to, to grant approvals. Why are they doing that? It's because they want 5G investment in their community. The cities that aspire to be smart cities, cities of innovation, they're going to need to be 5G cities. A smart city is a 5G city. Uh, a smart community, even a rural community that wants investment is going to need to be open to this, this kind of infrastructure investment, and it's in their interest. So I, I think we actually should, in addition to today's order, to today's order also, 
uh, think about how we can shine a light on the communities that are, that are going further uh, on their own initiative to be friendly to investment. Maybe there could be a recognition program that the FCC could do the, to identify the, the best 5G smart cities. One of the commissioners um, acknowledged that there has been and there will be some pushback, especially from large cities who are pushing back, especially on the pricing restrictions. Um, and that, those push, that pushback will come in the form of lawsuits. How successful do you think they'll be? Well, uh, you know, I think first of all, the first point to make is that the reaction among state and local communities has not been by any means uniformly against this. As John mentioned, we've seen a lot of communities that have done wonderful things. The FCC has, has collected many of these, Commissioner Carr and his team. Uh, there are a lot of state and local governments and state and local officials who are very, very supportive of what the FCC did today. It's, you know, finally they have some rules and some guidelines and some standards, which is really going to help everything. Even this whole process of working on this over the past year has just brought these issues to the forefront. So I think, you know, the first thing to say again is that there are a lot of communities that are supportive of what's going on. Yes, we understand that there is likely to be um, some litigation around this, um, particularly from the bigger cities um, that have sort of more sophisticated setups in place already. I don't think it was really them that the FCC was targeting as much in this order. Um, you know, the commission, I think, has done a pretty good job in just sort of reading through the actual text of the draft item, and we'll see the final item once the text is released. I think what they've done is eminently reasonable. It's a, under sections 253 and 332 of the Act. Um, you know, what they've done in terms of establishing reasonable guidelines, reasonable uh, uh, time limits, reasonable costs, all based on existing state and local legislation. Uh, you know, I, one can't predict the future entirely but I think the Commission has done a good job of sort of uh, trying to strengthen the order and in anticipation that there will be possible litigation. But, uh, you know, that being said, I don't think litigation necessarily serves anyone's interest. And I think we're hoping that, you know, as we've been saying, we can find a way to, to work around that. The, the, the key principle the Commission's trying to establish here, I think, is that the, the fees have to be reasonable and cost-based. They've indicated some levels that would be presumed to be reasonable, but they haven't actually dictated what the fees need to be. If a, if a community has a reason to believe that a higher fee is still cost-based and still reasonable, the community can do that. What a community can't do under this order is bring in fees that are not based on their costs. That's, that is a, a really important distinction. So the, the headline today isn't that the FCC set the prices. It's really that the FCC said the prices have to be reasonable. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's right. It, the question is what, what aspect of the order. For example, the, the dollar amounts are, there is no deemed granted, for example, if they exceed shot clocks where you automatically can start deploying, for example, or the like. These are all things that can be challenged in court by the provider if they don't if they don't agree with the terms and the terms are outside the, the level of the, um, of, of the order. What I can say is the FCC was quite clear that they were hoping that these, these guardrails would create opportunities for, for compromise. And I don't think anybody wants, wants to litigate if a, if, a, if a city has a legitimate reason for going beyond, a, uh, be, beyond either the fee or, or, or the time frame, then that can be discussed. And there, are, I think, will be many op instances where that proves out, and um, you know, we can avoid litigation. People want to deploy; they don't want to litigate, and and that's what we're hoping for. So, what has to happen next in the the march toward five G deployment? Um, well, I can offer a few other things. Um, first of all. I think um, you know we'll have to see how all of this develops on the infrastructure front. I think the FCC took a big, big step forward today, and we'll have to see how it all shakes out. They took an earlier step about six or seven months ago, and Commissioner Carr mentioned um, that that's already um, yielded some benefits in terms of I think replacement um, uh, small cells. Um, on the on the infrastructure front, um, you know we've. Uh, TIA has been pushing in this Congress for an infrastructure funding bill. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen it emerge um, for any number of reasons, but we're going to keep pushing that. And that's something that uh, 
might might actually have a chance even if control of Congress flips um, uh, because it's a somewhat bipartisan issue to work on infrastructure and and making sure that broadband deployment is a part of that and making sure that especially we're serving underserved communities um, and deploying things. Today, at today's open meeting, the FCC actually considered a, a, well, received a presentation on universal service program, and that's very important. Um, John earlier talked a little bit about spectrum, and so the commission has been doing a lot of good work there on the millimeter wave, the high band spectrum, um, the short range, high capacity spectrum, and they have several open proceedings right now, um, and they're moving as quickly as they can, I think, to try and bring some of those to, to completion. There's there's a few others in the mid-band spectrum, um, one on the 3.5 gigahertz that I think they've been chewing on for a while that they need to finish up. There's another one um, they're looking at right now on the C-band um, spectrum from 3.7 to 4.2 um, where there's going to be some action needed. So I think a combination of sort of you know infrastructure funding um, and infra infrastructure policy uh, as well as spectrum policy are sort of the other legs of the stool you could think of. But, but again, today's piece on, on the deployment uh, was a huge important component of this. Uh, Congress is considering some legislation that would be really helpful. Uh, whether it passes this year or next year. Uh, the Airwaves Act would, uh, in addition to directing the FCC to auction off, allocate and auction off some additional spectrum, would also dedicate a portion of the auction proceeds for rural, rural deployment, which would be really helpful. Uh, also, the Streamline Act would, uh, would uh, add some additional strength to the order that was already adopted today by the FCC. On the rural deployment, I. I I do want to make it clear that 5G has a role to play in rural America. It's not just an, an urban thing. The millimeter wave spectrum doesn't, you know, the millimeter waves don't propagate as far. So that's probably pretty expensive to deploy in rural areas. But 5G isn't just millimeter waves. It's high frequency, mid band, and low band. And you may not get quite the eye catching speeds in the mid bands and the low bands, especially the low bands that you can get at the higher frequency, but you do get the other benefits of 5G. The massive device densification at low energy, which could uh, revolutionize agriculture uh, or manufacturing in small towns. The uh, low latency, the quick response from the network, which is really important for autonomous driving, for telepresence, for sending robotic uh, rescuers into burning buildings or other dangerous situations. You need that low latency network performance. And that's something that's not, it's not even necessarily tied to small cells. It's something that can work uh, throughout the, the spectrum ranges. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo exactly what they said. I guess I wanna do a little deeper dive um, on uh, Beyond Spectrum, which you know we're a champion for, for more mid-band spectrum and for getting the, uh, the remaining millimeter wave bands auctioned. But there's also an ongoing effort I, I don't wanna leave alone in the federal government to make their assets more available, to create opportuni opportunities, not only so you can fill a gap in a national park or something, but there's a lot of federal buildings and assets in, in, in uh, you know, in, in, on Main Street America, which could um, help not only create connectivity near those buildings, but also create a sort of, be, you know, to be the first in setting a standard for also getting access to commercial buildings if you're able to, to, to get, to start the wave of creating, um, uh, you know, a, a connected community starting with the federal assets. That could be very helpful. And the White House is working on that, and we really appreciate that effort. Another thing is to avoid headwinds. You know, um, there's a term we like to use sometimes, don't do stupid things. <laughs> and so if you're trying to uh, promote 5G, don't do things to the tax code that makes it harder to deduct from borrowing to deploy, for example. Um, right now, there's a lot of concern in our, our industry about tariffs that are coming out that are aimed directly at 5G components in a way that they hadn't been to this point. And you look at, you know, you, you wanna send a clear message and stay on course so that, um, so that if you're going to be promoting 5G, you then don't create inadvertently headwinds that slow, slow 5G down in the US. 
We want to bring um, some of our viewers into the conversation. We have uh, taken some questions from the audience and we want to read them. Um, the first question uh, says the U.S. government has recently imposed, imposed tariffs on a large number of products from China, um, including telecom products. Uh, what effects will that have on 5G deployment? Jeff, you were just mentioning. Right. Well, you know, it's hard to know. Uh, so the 5G revolution is happening. Uh, you know, our concern is that it could be slowed and or you might get something that's, you know, not quite the robust 5G that that we want. Uh, you know, you'll it'll you might get 5G on your phone. The icon pops up to like LTE it does today. We want to go beyond that. And so when you look at some of the headwinds that can be uh, added, we're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars in costs added to equipment potentially from the most recent wave of tariffs. So I think it's important that the industry has recognized this and we're, we're hoping to work to, to mitigate that, that impact because making it more expensive to deploy is going to slow things down. And Clarence, if, any, if anybody's thinking of using tariffs to somehow help US 5G, they're, they're thinking about it wrong. The, the race to 5G isn't a race to have the, you know, the 5G patents uh, invented in the United States. If it was a race to have the most patents in the standard, uh, Samsung would, would feel pretty good about our position. We, by our count, we have the most standard essential patents in the 3GPP 5G standard. If it was a race to be the first to build a piece of network equipment that's approved by regulators, the, the thing I showed a moment ago, uh, was actually the first equipment in the world to be approved by a regulator when the FCC approved it back in February. But that's not the race to 5G that matters. The race that matters is that the networks get deployed in the U.S. and then those, those applications of 5G that are still to come that we haven't even thought of yet get deployed in the United States. And, and I remember, you know, when carriers were talking about building 4G, the same thing happened with 3G also, people didn't really know what it was going to be used for. And there were people who were saying, for, for, why would you want 4G? You don't really need to open your email faster, do you? Uh, you don't need to go look at the mobile optimized, simplified version of a website uh, because it's, you, your phone is really small. Well, there aren't mobile optimized, simplified versions of websites anymore because of 4G. You don't need that. But what happened as a result of the deployment of 4G is new things came along. And we talked about a few of those. I would add, you know, ride sharing, social networking. No one talked about those when 4G was being deployed. And now they, they create jobs, they create economic value. 5G is going to do the same thing. It's going to be things that we haven't even thought of today. And we need those to happen in America. Today's order will bring us closer to that. You know, before we leave the tariffs point, uh, I think there's also a sort of strategic national interest of the United States that's at stake here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm remembering back to earlier this year where there was this trial balloon that someone floated about, you know, should the government build a 5G network? Um, and of course, it flopped like a like a lead balloon and nobody in either party and certainly nobody in industry supported it but in one sense you understand what they were thinking because these, there are some folks in the US government that are desperately concerned about the US gov the ability of the United States to maintain leadership and get a 5G network uh, deployed and so when you've got you know, a national security apparatus in the United States worried about getting 5G out there. And then on the other hand, you have another part of the government that's saying, let's put these tariffs on that's going to hurt us actually deploying that 5G equipment. You know, it's got, you've got two parts of the government that have conflicting impulses here. So I think, you know, folks in Washington have to recognize that these tariffs on 5G equipment are not in the national interest of the United States, and we need to rethink that. And it is a national security issue as sure. well. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from our audience, uh, about how many small cells will be built in the next three to four years with the new rules um, than without the new rules? Hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen estimates that there will be hundreds of thousands of small cells as, as part of the overall 5G deployment. 
and, and I think they will be deployed faster because of the rules than they otherwise would have been. Um, so it's not so much a question of how many, but how soon. Yeah, I, I found it interesting in the FCC's order uh, that they recognized that the ripple effects of these costs on deployment of 5G. So not only if you spend a lot, for example, in a can't miss city, for ex example, that may harm your ability to expand your network as much as you want to elsewhere because you've spent so much money in one city, or if overall deployment costs in a region are particularly expensive, your deployment may be less robust. It's hard to quantify it um, exactly, but it, intuitively, if you have less money to, to invest in infrastructure, you'll be forced to invest in less infrastructure. Yeah, I think, you know, I saw a stat that maybe the U.S. has already deployed, and help me out, guys, if I'm wrong here, maybe 30,000 small cells. And we've seen that in China, they're already into the hundreds. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe the answer to, to, your, to the viewer's question is, uh, you know, this will just help us catch More. up yeah. <laughs> really fast. Yeah. Um, to where the rest of the world already is and is going. So uh, this, this is something we had to do. It's, yeah. Uh, another question from uh, Dave Bertston. Uh, what high volume applications that will be important in the next five years work significantly more effectively at a 25 to 50 percent increase in speed? I think it's more than 25 to 50 yeah, percent, to be it's honest. Be it's more like a tenfold increase right. in speed. Uh, and, uh, and also a tenfold decrease in network latency. So some of the things that you would expect would work better are uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, which could be for entertainment, but it could also be for uh, remote emergency services. It could be for, uh, for manufacturing. There are, it, it's kind of hard to imagine what companies are going to arise to offer services that take advantage of that capability, but I'm, I'm certain there will be. Uh, another is connected vehicles and leading ultimately to autonomous vehicles. And, and by the way, uh, for the transportation use cases, you don't necessarily have to have 100% deployment of 5G. If you have 5G uh, in congested traffic areas and along major arteries, including highways between towns, you can get a huge amount of the benefit uh, quicker than, than people maybe even are expecting. But that's, that's dependent on uh, both the bandwidth to, de to transmit all of the data, but also maybe even more so the low latency. Uh, a 5G network will get a, <clears throat> a signal back to you in a tenth the amount of time an LTE network, which could make the difference between traveling 100 feet in your car and traveling just 10 feet in your car. And I think a lot, of, a lot of the benefits are not going to be, I can watch a movie faster. It's going to be the types of industrial and machine-to-machine -machine use cases that you mentioned. And then, of course, sim as similar to 4G, those, those use cases that we, we can't imagine yet. And uh, we're hoping that those use cases are uh, grown here, uh, and that's, that's why this race to 5G is so important. At, at Samsung, we like watching movies faster also. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely there'll be, there'll be uh, manufacturing, there'll be consumer applications, there will be public safety, public service applications. And some of the revolutions in healthcare that are, are being proposed as well. Yeah. Remote, surgery, Remote surgery, other things that require uh, what we call the tactile internet. Uh, will require t um, gobs of data. That's a technical term. Yes. Uh, yes. That 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 we yeah that that require five G to be uh, safe and effective. We have another uh, question from the audience. Uh, what uh, is what will the role and importance of directional antennas be to support true five G mobility as compared to LTE, or is this an unfair comparison? Well. Um, when you say directional antennas, I hope people don't get in mind sort of the older technology where you had to have a dish on your roof and point it exactly at the right place, and if anybody bumps into it, then your signal is lost. With the, uh, with the equipment that I showed and that's being deployed now, 
because of that array of antennas, it's actually electronically steerable. And so it can adjust. And um, what we found is in the millimeter wave spectrum, if the direct line of sight gets blocked, maybe a truck parks in the way or something like that, the equipment will automatically find an alternative path that bounces off of a building or goes around a corner even. So it's less sensitive to the directionality. Um, uh, but yes, the, the questioner is right. The, the millimeter wave equipment, at least, doesn't radiate 360 degrees. It, it concentrates the energy. So you might have to have one pointing this way and one pointing that way to cover a whole area. Yeah, and there's also the, the thought that, you know, in addition to consistently, we consistently ask for more and more spectrum. At the same time, our engineers are learning how to use that spectrum more efficiently. So for example, you could change the directionality of the, uh, of, of the emissions t during rush hour. So when people are going, more people are going one way, this signal can be more effective in, in the appropriate direction and so on. So not only do you, um, not, not only is it, it, do you get a better signal, but you're using the spectrum what you've got more efficiently. I want to uh, just wrap up with your final thoughts on today's order, if, you, if any, um, and, and, and what your thoughts are moving forward. It's a good day for America. It's a, a, a real step forward, and congratulations to the FCC. Yeah, I, I agree with John. Uh, it was a major, major step forward. It was the culmination of an effort that the Commission has been working on for a year and a half. Commissioner Carr, in particular, um, should be applauded for his leadership and, and all of his staff and his team for the work that they've, that they've done. I know he's traveled around the country. He even um, visited a TIA member company um, and, and saw some of the technology in action. So just want to thank him and, and applaud the FCC for, for what they did today. Yeah, I'll echo that thank you to the FCC and, and in particular to Commissioner Carr and his advisors. This, this uh, was a major effort, a major achievement. I would say one of the most important things is the recognition uh, that the network is important, that in order to have this, the services that we all love, you need to be able to connect to a network to do it, and that, that this is one of many steps this FCC has taken to recognize the importance of network innovation and deployment, and that's a big achievement. Well, I want to thank you all for being with us today. And of course, thank you for your participation and for watching. We'd like to hear from you, uh, so reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. And of course, you can see more of our content at tianow.org and on our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.